We'll be starting in two minutes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, you got it. All good. You, sorry, say say something again. I will be starting in two minutes. No. Oh. You're good. You're good. Okay. I always leave the YouTube thing open. Okay. I could say a few words of introduction, if you like, just before you start. Okay, it's 105. I think we should start. You want to uh, go ahead, Alan? Sure. Do you want to uh, put up your notebook? Just then, um, I'll just say um, maybe a few seconds of introduction. Yeah. Philip might have a few things to say as well. I hear him barking in the background. <laughs> so, uh, ju uh, just to introduce a little bit of what um, Dave's going to do today with ODs and parameterized types. Uh, I think I think the very title is kind of interesting. Oh, we lost your screen, but it is interesting because I think in many other courses you would learn how to solve an ODE or you would learn how to call a package for an ODE. But I don't know of many courses where you would learn the influence of the software language on the calling of the ODEs or how one can use software constructs to build a library or make use of a library. And so I think this is something that's very novel for the course that we're teaching. I mean, maybe you find it somewhere else, I'm not sure, but I think it would be very hard to find. Uh, but that's exactly what Dave's going to do today. So I'm gonna let you go ahead and do, do just that. Yeah, uh, thanks Alan, hi everybody. So as Alan was saying, uh, we're going to look at solving ODEs, ordinary, ordinary differential equations that we started looking at in the previous lecture, but we're going to solve them by using a package or a library uh, in, written in Julia. So uh, the, the things we'll look at today are how can we actually use libraries? Well, you kind of know that already. We've been using several different libraries like plots.jl. Uh, so you know, I'm going to use the, the word library interchangeably with the word package. Um, but the point of the lecture will actually be, apart from to learn, you know, the basics of how to learn how to use this particular library, which is called differential equations.jl. It's also really about how that library is actually structured. How do you structure a, a library in Julia? And the answer to that is usually that it's structured around types and objects that have those particular types. So for example, we'll see that if we want to plot, um, you know, we want to solve an ODE that will give us a new object. Uh, of a particular type, and then we need to we, we want we want to actually be able to plot uh, objects of those types, and so we define these things called plot recipes that allow us to communicate with plots.jl the information about our types. We'll also see how we can make objects behave as if they were functions. Basically, we turn objects into functions that we can call, so they're called callable objects. And um, we'll also look at type parameters, which is a key to making all of this actually fast or performant in Julia. So let's just recall what, what a differential equation is that you know, we, we derived last time. So it's gonna look something like this. The derivative of u with respect to time equals minus p times u. So I'm always use, gonna use u dot to mean the derivative of u with respect to time. So this is an equation that relates a function u to its derivative. It is basically tells us that we're you know, at a certain time and we're at a certain position in space, it tells us how we can move from that position, which direction we need to move in. So we're gonna move a little bit in that direction. And then as soon as we move a little bit, uh, this equation tells us that actually the direction that we move needs to change a bit. And so then we're going to use the new direction to move uh, the next little bit. 
And that's, we saw that basically we can convert that into an algorithm uh, using time stepping, which is literally taking these little steps in an algorithm. And so we looked at that using the Euler method, but it turns out that the Euler method is you know, nice and simple to derive and intuitive, but it's actually a pretty bad numerical method. It doesn't behave very nicely uh, in many, many different ways. And so basically you should never ever use the Euler method in reality. And so instead, even but it is a shame that I think many students mm -hmm. walk away from all too many introductory courses thinking that the order right. is the yeah. way you do these things. That's definitely true. Yeah. So basically, the the message is you should never, ever, ever use the Euler method to integrate an or ordinary differential equation. There are there's a version of the Euler method for stochastic differential equations that uh, that you can use. But anyway, um, so what should you do instead? You should use a more complicated method that more more closely you know um, reproduces the true solution of a differential equation and um, we derive methods more advanced methods in courses like 18313 numerical analysis that i put a link to in this notebook uh, but in this in this lecture we're not of course going to go into those methods we're just going to use a package that already implemented those methods in a very nice way so we're going to look at how we can actually access all of these basically state-of-the-art numerical methods via the package. So we want a way to you know, write down this differential equation and then solve it using the package basically with this a given initial condition. Okay, so this uh, package that I put a link to differential equations.jl has been developed over the last few years. Um, the, the lead developer, Chris Rikorkus is currently a, uh, an instructor at MIT in the math department and <clears throat> So the, the, basically the, the goal is to sort of be a, you know, what you, you could call a one-stop shop for solving differential equations. And basically to try and implement all the methods that are known. And there are, there are a lot of different methods known and basically try to implement them all in a, a sort of coherent way uh, so that you can just swap in and out different methods and test, is this method good for this particular type of equation? Because different types of equations behave in a different way, have different behavior. And so different uh, numerical methods might actually be better or worse for those particular equations. So they've done a lot of work to benchmark which, which methods work on which types of equations and actually to choose automatically uh, a correct method uh, based on how, you know, as they're solving the equation, they will, will actually change the method in the middle if they realize, if the package realizes that you know, the solution is changing the way it behaves. For example, if it's changing very fast, you might want a different kind of method than if it's changing slowly. Okay, so how do we actually use this package? So we need to write our differential equation in a particular way, which looks like this. So we have u, which is the dependent variable uh, or variables, is gonna be some function f of time t and the position, the current position u. And then there's this p, which is our parameters um, of the function. So what does that all mean? So let's just think about our u dot equals minus p u example. Wait, then, what, what is this dot thing again? What is, what is a dot? Yeah, I already said dot is d by dt. It's the der derivative with respect to time of the, of the variables u. Okay. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> f, uh, so, so basically we, we need to write the right hand side of our differential equation as a function that's gonna take in the variables u and the current time t. And in fact, it also needs to take in the parameters p. And so it's gonna look like this. You're always gonna write it down as f of three things, the variables u, the parameters p and the time t. Even though in this particular case, our differential equation u dot equals minus p u does not depend explicitly on time. The right hand side minus p u does not have time. Right? I can actually write that down. Note, no explicit time dependence on t. So there's no t in the right hand side, but I still need to put the t in this function uh, because the software assumes that all the functions that you pass to it will have three different arguments. Okay. So <clears throat> now we need to specify the data that we're going to give to the differential equation solver. A differential equation solver is literally just a piece of software, probably a function that you're going to call that will take in the information about the differential equation and literally solve it. So give you some kind of thing back that represents the solution. In other words, a function over this time interval. So the time span or time interval, I give, have to give us a tuple, a pair of two numbers, the start point, the starting you know, time, 
which I've chosen to be zero, and the end time, 10. And this u0 is the initial value of u, right? The value at time zero. So I could have written that with a sub u, u sub, subscript zero, but then it just makes it more difficult to type. So I just left it as u, u, u0 is the name of the variable. So just defining those two variables. And now we need to give all of this information to the solver, to the, to the package. So how do we do that? It turns out that in this particular package and in many Julia packages, this is a very common way to design packages in Julia. What we do is we actually introduce a new type. So the packet in, inside the differential equations.jl package, they, there is this type called ODE problem defined. And there are various constructors defined for that type. So we've seen all of these concepts before, but now we're going to see how they're actually used inside a sort of prop, inside a sort of full-fledged state-of-the-art numerical package. So basically, there's this type defined, and we'll actually define our own little version of this later to see what's going on inside. There's just a type defined and this constructor where you pass in these four arguments. So you, you pass into this type the function that you want to inter integrate that represents the differential equation, the initial condition, the time span, which is this tuple, and the set of parameters that you're passing in. And you just put those inside this constructor and you call the result something. So you give it a name, which I've just called it problem with a, a lowercase p. So note that, you know, um, Julia is case sensitive, as you know, so you have to get all of these capitals right, right? So it's capital O, capital E, D, capital E, capital P for problem, and then everything else is lowercase. And then, so when we define that object, you'll notice that it prints out or displays some information about the, this object. <clears throat> so it tells us, you know, it repeats what the time span is, what the initial condition is. But in fact, currently, it does not display the values of the parameters that you passed in. And that, uh, but it does tell you what the type of the U is. U is of type float 64. And it tells you what the type of these times is. They're also float 64. And it tells you that it's in place. So it, there's in place uh, and out of place. Out of place means um, that you act. OK, so sorry, in place is false. So that's telling us that it is not in place. In place just means that you also are going to pass in uh, in an array which you modify to update the differential equation. That's not what we're doing here. We're making a function which returns a new value that we're not modifying anything. Uh, the idea of the, the modifying is that you can pre-allocate memory and that will actually make it more efficient. But we won't go into that today, but that is a, an important thing to know if you're gonna use this package in an actual uh, sort of more, more uh, intensive way. Okay, so now we have set up this problem object. This is an object of type ODE problem. Now what we need to do is solve this ODE, right? To solve this sort of problem that we've set up with all of this information, all this data. So indeed, they, they have provided a nice function called solve, which literally you pass in this problem object and it will solve it for you. So that's what we've done here. Solution equals solve of problem. Very, very nice syntax, you know, very intuitive. Um, and what happens if we do that? We see that it returns another object, in fact. So we'll, we're going to look at the objects in more detail later. By the way, we've but got a just... question in the chat. I think it, I missed it. It was already a, a couple of minutes back. Um, but we've got a question about, I think it was when you said that, well, you know, it doesn't look like U depends on T, but it does look like U depends on T. Yes. I've always yes. found that a little confusing. Maybe, maybe... It, is a, it is confusing, yeah. So. Right, yeah, so exactly. The solution U of this equation, the solution U, uh, uh, yeah, the solution U of this equation is a function, and that is a function of time. That is definitely true. But in, when I write down the differential equation, in the right-hand side of this differential equation, there is no T, right? I do not see the letter T here. Uh, so when would I see a letter a T there? For example, if I um, had some, Cosine, so for example, I, I was sort of, there was some, suppose this was the number of people are, are recovering from a disease, and there was some, you know, it was, I was modeling measles or something where there was some effect of the fact that I have children going back to school, which sort of has this periodic uh, behavior where they go back to school and then they go on holiday and then they go back to school and they go well, on I, holiday. I, I still think this is confusing. Like, well, so, so what I'm going to say is now I can add plus cos of t to the right-hand side of the equation. And then there's an explicit t there now. 
It actually I, depends it, on it, the it, actual it, time at which I'm, 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 I'm doing something. But, but you know, you does depend on tea in the end. So yeah, you but, does depend on tea, definitely. But I do not have a, there's no tea. I don't write tea in this right hand side. That's the point. That's what, that's why people talk about an explicit time dependence. That means there's literally a T in the, in the right-hand side of the differential equation like that. Yeah, I agree, it's, 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 it is confusing. Because in textbooks, you, would also, you could also you know, write this as sort of, uh, actually I did here, U dot of T equals minus P U of T. To, to emphasize that U is a function of T and uh, you know, then U at the time T is a number and that tells me what the derivative is at that particular yeah, I mean, well, another way, if you don't scroll, stay where you are. Another way to say it is if you just look at the right-hand side uh, above you, the, the thing to the right-hand side of the u dot equals, the, the minus pu, the yeah. right-hand side is, 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 is by itself a function of pu and potentially t, but not in this, in this example. Um, that's what we're talking about. The fact that, the, yeah. that you're adding on the u dot and solving, so you're going to get a u of t, is, is, is coming later. But it's not it's not there yet in the right hand side. Yeah. That's the way I think right. of it. So ba basically, you know, you can also think of it as if you start at a later time. So you know, suppose I started at time ten with this initial value instead of time zero, then this equation would decay in exactly the same way because it doesn't depend. There's no explicit time dependence. It doesn't depend on the value of t. Whereas if I have my cos t term, that would actually depend exactly on when, when you You're started. Not like me, it doesn't slow down in the morning and speed up later in the day. Exactly. Got it. Good example. Good, uh, good analogy. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we are solving this problem, right? We set up the problem in this object, this variable called problem with a lowercase p. And then we're calling the solve function by passing in that object into the solve function. The solve function knows that it's going to receive an object of type ODE problem, and it knows what to do with it. And it will do some magic that is basically doing something like the Euler method, but using a more complicated numerical method. And um, <clears throat> it will produce some output. And the output is um, being shown right here. So currently I have this value of p, and then I'm passing in p. So where, where am I defining p? p is actually defined down here. So all of these plots look weird because p is currently zero, which is pretty useless. So let's make p something non-zero. It's gonna recalculate all of these plots, and now I can see something more interesting, okay? So uh, here we go. So it has solved the problem with that value of p, 0 0.2 in this case, it starts with a value of 100 because I told it to at time zero, that was my initial condition, and everything else gets calculated by this numerical algorithm. Just in, So this is basically doing some kind of time stepping, but a much more sophisticated kind than the Euler method that we looked at. In particular, you can see that the time steps between these different, so that this column one, two, three, four is just labeling which row we're in. The actual data that it's outputting is this, sort of timestamp, which is a float 64, which tells me when, which time points it's evaluating at, it's calculating at, and then the value, which is the height of this curve that I'm trying to solve, u at that particular time t that's given by this first column. And you can see that the differences between these times is not, are not constant, in fact. So the solver is actually choosing how to space out these times. And you can see that as it goes on, it's sort of increasing the time spacings because it realizes that, oh, this is a nice smooth function, so I can take nice big steps. I know roughly how the function is behaving or pretty accurately how the function is behaving. So this is the output of this solver. It has only eight time, time points you know, uh, for this particular differential equation for this particular initial condition, et cetera. Okay, so, so what is inside this solution object we'll look at in a minute. Let's just, first of all, see what we can do with it. Now, I would like to plot the solution, right? So let's just try plot of solution. They can literally write plot of solution. And again, it knows how to plot the solution. And it gives me this plot of this nice smooth curve as a function of time. Uh, and it even labels the t-axis for me. And then I added this label solution onto the plot. Okay, so. So everybody who's watching this should be think this is like amazing. Like, yeah, we, we have. Yeah. We had we had eight time steps where you might have expected there would be like a hundred or a thousand. Right. And you're getting this, you're plotting the solution, but instead of getting eight points, you're getting this beautiful, beautiful continuous curve. Like yeah. something magical must have happened yeah. here 
And and this like whatever is happening. So what is happening? So um, oh, you're gonna give it away? <laughs> oh well, yeah. <laughs> I want the people to just like be in awe for a few more seconds. Okay, sure. Like because I don't think this would happen in any other numerical library that I know of. So there's something very interesting going on. Right. All right, go ahead, give it away. Oh, so I can jump down to say, to, 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 to show this curve, which is um, what happened. Th these are the actual data points, these are red points, right? So those are the eight data points, but somehow it doesn't just have those eight data points. Somehow it's able to tell us what is happening between those time points as well. Uh, with this, with some kind of smooth, you know, nonlinear curve. You, you might think, oh, it's going to, join up these data points with just straight lines between them, but that's not what it's doing. It's doing something mo much more sophisticated. And, so and what, somehow this is where the computer science mixes with the computational science. Yeah, yeah. The sort of thing that I always love to kind of point out that, you know, one alone doesn't quite do the trick. Yeah, so the, the first surprising thing is that we're actually even able to do this plot of solutions. So what's going on there? Plot is from the plots.jl package and plots.jl does not know about differential equations. So what happens is that differential equations.jl is defining what's something called a plot recipe. And that's just a, literally a recipe as a long set of instructions for it's telling plots. It's sort of adding some information to plots to say how to actually plot objects of this type. So we won't go into exactly how you do that, the syntax, but it's actually not that difficult to do. So if you define your own type, you can define a plot recipe on that type, which just basically tells you the, you know, how to extract the information from inside the type and convert it into a plot. What is it exactly that you want to plot? And so that's what they, what they did, but how do they get this nice smooth curve? So can I give it away now? Go for it. Okay, so <clears throat> what it's doing is something called interpolation. So although it seems like it only has this, this data at these particular points, the, this, the actual differential equation, the actual solution method of the differential equation that it's using um, also provides a sort of polynomial fit uh, in between those data points. And it just needs to evaluate that polynomial uh, at each given time in order to tell you what the approximate value of the solution I actually, is. I don't know exactly how it works, but I would imagine that in the course of solving a differential equation, I mean, you're given the derivative as well as the value at a point. So instead right. of, you know, if you just connect the two points, you know, a straight lines determined by two points, the, you know, two pieces of information, but you'd have the derivative, that ought to be four pieces of information so you could get a cubic. Right. I don't know if that's what it's doing or if it's doing something fancier than that. It was even more fancy than that, yeah. But basically the, the, the actual numerical solution method the nature of it is to basically give you a sort of Taylor expansion of the function. And that Taylor expansion is a polynomial approximation and it just, it just needs to evaluate that polynomial approximation at different places. And so we can actually get access to that ourselves. We can do something like this. Let's define TT as 3.5. That is not one of the points where it gave us the data, but we, want, we still want the value there. We can just evaluate the solution object as if it were a function. So this is you know, using the normal Julius function called syntax, but passing in this TT, and it's calling an interpolate, this interpolation method to evaluate this polynomial at that point. And then let's just add that point onto the, onto the curve, and you can see that indeed it, it lies on the curve. So this curve is basically just evaluating that interpolating function at many, many points along uh, between zero and 10 in order to draw this smooth curve and, and in order to give the sort of full solution. So we're able to pretend that on the one hand, we only have 10 points, but we're able to pretend it's a continuous function now, and we could even call it as if it was a function. Is it, right? It was yes. a list, you know, is, it a li is it discrete? Is it continuous? It's kind of both, right? It's, got, it's a list of right. points. It's a continuous right. curve, right? Yeah. There's no, you know, the, somehow this data structure is magically treating it either which way, depending on what you want to do with it. That's definitely true. So how did we get those discrete points out, actually? Well, it turns out that inside the solution object, there are various fields, just like we've seen in, in, you know, when, when we've defined our own types. And you can extract the T, right? So if I do solution.t, I get a vector of those timestamps that we saw before. And if I do solution.u, I get a vector of the values of u at those particular times, which just those eight points. Those are, that's what I'm plotting here with these, these dots. So all of that is contained inside the solution object, but the solution object also contains more stuff, which is 
how to in do this interpolation. Okay, great. So, by the way, of course, this is Pluto, so we can just grab P and you know move it in a slider, and it's actually it's being a bit slower than usual. Oh, that's because I'm using Plotly. Let me switch back to GR. Then um, when I do that now, it should be much faster, and it sort of updates almost in real time. So it's basically solving this, you know, as I'm changing P, it's resolving the differential equation every time using the package. And that's actually pretty fast and fast enough so that I can, uh, you know, plot it in basically real time. And here I'm comparing the numerical solution to the exact analytical solution. We know exactly how to solve this PDE. It's this exponential decay that we saw last time. So I can just compare the two visually and we see that visually they're identical. That they're slight, you know, the, if we calculate the, the difference, the distance between them, it'll be slightly non-zero because we, we're not calculating the exact solution with this numerical method. We're calculating an approximation to some very high accuracy. Okay. So <clears throat> we can also use the package to not only solve one differential equation, but also a system of differential equations like these SIR equations that we saw last time that model the dynamics of a population. So here are the equations again. Again, you know, dot is still the derivative with respect to time. S was the number of susceptibles or the number of people who might catch the disease. I is the number of infected. R is the number of recovered. And we had these, uh, these, these equations with these rates and beta and gamma that defines the dynamics of this system. And it turns out that in order to use this in a differential equation solver, we need to think of this as well, one way to think of it is as a set of uh, equations for or a, a single equation, actually, for vectors. So we're going to convert this these three set of three equations into a single equation, but for a vector. So we're going to put all of the variables S, I, and R into a vector called capital, uh, called boldface X. Or also we could think of them as X1, X2, and X3, the three variables S, I, and R. And then uh, it's basically the same structure as before, but now everything is a vector. So f also has to, has to be a vector because we're feeding in a vector x and we need a vector out, which is going to be the right-hand side of this, this derivative of this vector. And so basically, this f is going to consist of three functions which give the right-hand sides of each of these three equations. So that all looks very you know, mathematical and complicated, but when, once, once we actually turn it into code, it's not that complicated at all. So we're going to just put the three uh, variables into a vector. Here's the vector of s, the initial s. You know, I could actually let's actually make that more explicit. So s zero is zero point nine nine, i zero is zero point zero one, and r zero is zero point zero zero, and then equals, and then I'm just going to put s zero, i zero, and r zero into my vector x zero. Right. So x zero is the initial vector. There it is. And now I need to a time span again. So this time I just uh, wrote down the time span right here, zero to 50 is my time span. And now I need the function that defines the differential equation. And so I'm, it has the same structure, I called it capital SIR, has the same structure. I need to pass in the variable, the dependent variable, the parameters and the time, just like I did with my function F that I defined right at the start. But x is now a vector. And so the first thing I can do is unpack that vector into my three variables, s, i, and r, the three local variables inside this function. And p is the parameters. That I now have two parameters, beta and gamma. So I'm going to unpack those as well. Beta, gamma equals p. I so if you prefer, you can, if it's more readable than like x of 1, x of 2. Then yeah, then exactly. That makes it much more readable because now I can just transcribe the equations just like I had them upstairs. Right. So here are the three equations, these are the right-hand sides. The, the first one is the right-hand side of, of x1 dot or s dot, and that was just minus beta times s times i. The second one is i dot, that was beta times s times i minus gamma times i. And the third one is r dot, which is just gamma times i, and I put those, wrap those in a vector with this square bracket. So this is kind of the simplest way you could do it. There are more sophisticated things you could do to make it more efficient. Okay, so I, as I was trying, what was saying, um, you can, if you prefer, you can add parentheses here just to make it clear that that is a tuple that you're, you're, you're making equal to this vector. And that's going to unpack the vector into this tuple. So it's basically going to define each of these variables separately as the comp relative, the, the, the respective components of this vector. 
Okay, so that's my SIR function. And here it is the set of parameters. I have beta and gamma that are defined by sliders just downstairs. And now I have my SIR problem. So again, I'm just gonna use the same ODE problem object. And I pass in all of these new, uh, these new things, which are now, you know, they're, they're now all vector objects. But I just pass them into ODE problem and it recognizes, oh yes, now the type of the outputs or the input, you know, the type of the uh, U0, the initial condition is now a vector of flow 64. So it's actually telling me that here. And um, here's the initial value, right? Okay, so now I do the same thing again. I just solve my SIR problem, this ODE problem object, and I get out the, the output and here it is. So what does that look like now? It has timestamps just like it did before. Now there's, it has chosen more times because one of the functions changes faster and also because I'm going up to a longer time, which is time 50. So it's now taking 26 steps of different of different lengths. And here it's, it's, it's telling me that, oh yeah, I, ha I now have three uh, values in my solution at each time. It's a vector of three values. So this is just a way that, it's, you know, that it has chosen to display this information, but, but it, the information is all contained inside this solution object in some way. Okay, so again, we can try to plot these things. So let's just again, try plot of Sol. And we see that it actually gives me, let me just make that a bit smaller. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll add line width equals two. There we go. So you can see that, okay, it's labeling it as U1. There's ways to change that. Let's just add some labels. Uh, I always forget exactly how to do this. I think it's like this. It's a, it's a sort of matrix of uh, labels and then it labels the curves correctly. So S starts off at one almost. Almost all of the population was susceptible and the, the amount that the, the, the proportion that's susceptible drops almost to zero. And then uh, I is this red curve which co or orange, which goes up almost to 75%. So we uh, almost, you know, everybody got infected sort of at one particular moment and then drops back down. And this is the re recovered, which goes almost to one. But then I can change these parameters. And as I change the parameters, it's resolving the differential equations at every step. And um, I shouldn't let it go negative because that's not very physical. And um, as I change, you know, this is the gamma is the recovery rate. You can see as the recovery rate gets bigger, um, everybody recovers faster, of course. So, so, you know, it's again, even though there's now three equations that it's solving at every step or one vector equation with three unknowns, uh, it's still pretty, pretty fast. This is a very fast package. So that's how, that's the sort of basic usage of the differential equations of JL package. It has a lot more bells and whistles. In particular, one of the things that I can do, for example, is actually, okay, okay, before I get, get, in, get into that, we can also plot other, com other things. So we can plot different combinations of variables. So here I'm plotting just variables one and two. I'm not plotting time anymore on this graph or rather time is implicit. So what, it was, what is happening is that this arrow is telling me that I'm supposed to follow this curve in this direction. So the initial condition is here, right? It's S equals almost one and I equals almost zero. And then as time goes on, I'm following this curve. So this is a representation of what's called state space or phase space, which, which is basically a picture of all the possible states of the system. Here, I'm only drawing S and I, I'm not drawing R. So it's not really all the possible states, but um, anyway. So basically we can see on this picture how S and I change over time by following along this curve in time. So again, we could do an animation of that, which would be, that would be a nice exercise. Okay, and then actually, but we only have three variables in this problem. So actually we could even draw in 3D if we wanted to. And so here's a version of that plot in 3D. This is the, the, the full state space or phase space um, in three dimensions. I'm gonna to have to replot this. So I'm specifying that I want to plot these three variables. This vars means variables. And here is the plot of how S, I, and R all change in time. And so it goes sort of up this curve, which bends round and comes back, you know, the, the I gets big and then gets small again. Okay, I'm 
there seems to be some issue with yeah i think i might have got these labels in the wrong order anyway okay and so by the way there's another library in this differential equations ecosystem now called sciml for scientific machine learning which is called modeling toolkit and that enables you i've mentioned the symbolics.jl package before that enables you to basically specify odes in a very nice way a sort of symbolic way that's much more intuitive in a way than using these than defining by hand these sort of vector functions but we won't go into that right now so okay so <clears throat> what 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 sort of lessons can we learn from this so so what, what i was trying to say is that many julia packages are structured in this way you have types which you pass information into and then you call some function on that type and it returns another type that contains the output that's a very common pattern yeah so one of the things i wanted to say was um that if we have this solve let's call that solve two solve uh it is choosing a numerical method to use but i can actually tell it which numerical method i want to use for example i can use the euler method like this uh, and i need to give it a step size no okay i don't remember how to do that but let's just call yeah, let's just use this one so sit five is a particular numerical method developed by a uh, greek uh, researcher called Sitouras, that's why it's called Sit. And five is because it's what a uh, so called Runga Kutta method of order five, roughly. And um, so basically, what am I doing here? I'm creating this new object. This is also an object. This is a constructor of a an object called Sit five that's also defined by differential equations.jl. So if I, I do, you know, uh, Sit five with parentheses, and I call that, I don't know, um, method then I can look inside method and try and work out what is what it lives inside. And apparently uh, nothing lives inside. So this is actually just, this, this, uh, this type exists only to specify to the solve procedure which method it should actually be using. There's nothing actually stored inside this type. It's just a kind of label that enables Julia to uh, to dispatch. So uh, Julia is based on this multiple dispatch paradigm. So basically there are different, you can think of conceptually at least, there are, there are different versions of this solve function, which different methods, which um, depend on which kind of object I pass in as the, the next argument. It will actually conce conceivably call different versions of the solve function for different types of algorithm. Uh, actually, if we look at the methods of solve, we can see that there are, well, there are there aren't very many actually. But so what is happening is that this uh, sit five object is actually being passed in, you know, inside the solve function. It's calling some other functions, and those functions will actually differ depending on which uh, algorithm object I pass in. Okay, so let's. Um, so one of the things we saw was that the solution object can be used as a callable function. So let's see how to actually do that. So how can I do solution? And because solution is an object, so how can I make that into something I can call as a function? So as an example, um, you know, if if I define a matrix A, we cannot usually use it as a vec as a, as if it were a function. A function call would have these square bracket these round brackets parentheses whereas we need square brackets to index into an array. But if we want to, for example, define matrix as a function of a vector to mean matrix times that vector, well, that doesn't actually work. So we could actually define that if we wanted, um, and the syntax would look like this. So we, we say, I want to treat a matrix A as a function. So I wrap that whole thing in parentheses, and I say that thing acting on, a fun on an object X is given by a times x. That's how I, that's the syntax to actually make an, ob, an object of type matrix into something that I can call. Note that that is different from calling the, the, the type matrix. This is calling a constructor of the matrix type. This is going to be defining how to call an object of type matrix as a function. So, but I should not actually do this because this is what's called type piracy. I do not own any of these objects. Base Julia owns the matrix object and owns you know, a vector or whatever I'm calling it on. But 
I'm quite at liberty to do that myself if I have my own type. So here's an example. If we want to, to create an object like this solution object, so we're going to have some kind of simple Euler output type, which is going to have a list of times and values where we're calculating these outputs of the Euler method. And then I want to be able to interpolate that at any other time. I would define it like this function of, again, I have the same syntax. I wrap everything in parentheses and I say, I want to define what it means to call an object of type simple Euler output, which is called solution. And so I, 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 I specify it like this and then at the time t, and then inside, I'm gonna calculate using some kind of interpolation, so probably just straight lines joining the, the points that I calculate. Um, I'm gonna calculate uh, the, the value at time t. And in order to do that, what I'm gonna need is to use the information that is inside this object of type solution. So solution.times will give me that vector of times that lives inside that object, and solution.values will give me the values. And I'm going to use those inside this function to calculate the correct thing. So that is how we can make objects coolable um, in a pretty simple way, actually. And then we can just use them as if they were functions. Okay, so I would call this as, again, solution. You know, if solution was simple Euler output of sort of the vector one, two and the vector three, four, I would call that as, so let's just go let's say um, sort of return a string interpolating at time t. And then I would call it as, sorry, time t. I would call it as solution at time 3.5. And it says interpolating at time 3.5. And then I would actually go and calculate that, as I said, using this data that lives inside this solution object, right? So I want to interpolate it. So, okay, that's beyond the limits of my time. So let's, let's say interpolate at 1.5. That would actually do some kind of linear interpolation between these data points. Okay, and by the way, right now, uh, Pluto has uh, this uh, limitation that this function where you define how to call objects of that type actually has to be in the same cell as uh, the definition of the type. Hopefully that will re restriction, restriction will be removed at some point soon. Okay, so <clears throat> let's dig a little bit into the actual objects that, are, that we've, you know, we've been using. So let's start by looking again at this ODE problem type. So what is actually inside that object? What does it actually do? Does it just put in the, does it just sort of, sort of uh, put the information that I send in, does it just put that into an object, literally one after the other? And the answer is it almost does that, but not quite. So we can actually see what fields are in this object using this uh, syntax, field names of type of problem. Right, so type of problem is ODE problem. And, but it has all of this complicated stuff that we'll get to in a minute. But first of all, let's just look at the field names and here they are. So inside problem, it has an F, a U0, a T span and a P. That's not surprising because that's what we passed in ourselves. It also has these other two things that are, you can use for uh, more complicated uh, usages of this object. So KW args means keyword arguments and then there's this other problem type object that tells you what kind of problem it is. So here you can see, so we can actually ask, ask for the, those, that data in the usual way, right? So problem, well, I, I put it down here. So problem dot u zero is extracting the u zero from this problem object. And you know, that was, if you remember 100.0, that was the initial value. And the T span is this, this tuple of two values, et cetera. So for example, problem, you, we, we can see from here that there's a problem type field. So let's, let's look at that. So problem dot problem type, it turns out to be this particular type that's also defined in this sort of differential equations library or ecosystem. So this is a standard ODE problem. There are all kinds of other ODE problems. So this is something that we did not pass in, right? We never said, oh, this is a standard ODE problem. What happened was when we called the, con the constructor of the ODE problem type, it realized that because of the type of information we were passing in, this was a standard ODE problem instead of you know, some other kind of stochastic problem or, or more complicated, or there are various other kinds of ODE problems where you split the variables in some way, et cetera. 
So basically, it's not quite doing just the, the, the boring thing of putting all of this information into a new object, which is just going to hold that information. It's actually doing some computations on the information we passed in and storing some more information into the object. So a way to see one way to see everything that's contained into, inside the object, instead of just doing this sort of one by one like this problem dot something. Oh, so by the way, you can do problem dot tab. If you press the tab key, it will give you interactively, it will give you this list of what's inside. That's a, a more useful way to do it if you're using something interactively. Okay, so to see everything contained in there, we, we've already seen this. I think we can use the dump in Pluto with a capital D, or if we're outside Pluto, we can use dump with a little d. And it will print out or display everything that's contained inside the object. So again, it's telling us that we're, this is of type ODE problem, and it contains f, which is the function that we passed in. But you'll notice that what f is now is this complicated other thing. What is this? It's actually another type called ODE function, which is wrapping my function f. And again, it has more information about f than I put in. But it basically kind of computed more information about f. And so you can see, for example, that um, that all of this stuff here is actually about different about derivatives. So it's telling me, do I have access to the Jacobian, for example, here this Jack is Jacobian of the function. So you can actually pass in a Jacobian. If you know the Jacobian or the, the, the derivative of your function, you can pass it in and it will actually be able to use that extra information to do a better job of solving the differential equation. Or you can use automatic differentiation and it will automatically calculate that for you. And it will store that in, but it only wants to do that calculation once. And so it has to store that information somewhere. And so it will actually store it in this, in this new object. So you can see that it's doing something pretty sophisticated with the information that we pass in. And then everything else is, you know, the U0 and the T-span and the P are exactly what I passed in. And then, as I said, it also has this other stuff that's used for more uh, complicated applications. And similarly, we can look at the solution object. Uh, so type of solution, well, what do we expect it to contain? We expect it to contain the values of U that were output and the values of T. Um, so those are definitely in there, the, the data that we were using before. But also, it needs to know how to do this interpolation. So everything else here, I believe, is information, extra information about something about what happened during the solving process. So you can see that, for example, it stores the whole prob, the ODE problem is actually stored inside the solution type so that you actually can reconstruct, oh, what was it that I actually calculated? And then um, there's this other object called alg, and which is actually telling us which algorithms were used to solve this uh, system. And so um, it, it, it's, it's choosing one of these default algorithms, or maybe it's even switching between them, right? So you can see that it might actually be choosing different algorithms to use at different moments, depending on the behavior of the function. So I can't, tell, I, 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 I can't interpret this to tell, tell you exactly which method was used for which part of the integration, but you can actually reconstruct from this information exactly what it did, I believe. And then there's this interp object, which is doing the interpolation. And here's some information that it needs for that. It needs coefficients of these polynomials, which are stored, stored here somewhere. And uh, from that, again, it can reconstruct the whole thing. So if you, if, you, you know, if you do a very long integration and you get out all this information, you probably just want to store it to disk. You can just sort of dump this whole object to disk, and then you can reconstitute it later and you have your solution in a very structured way so that you can actually, you know, for example, interpolate at a different position that you hadn't interpolated at before, for example, to get you know, a solution uh, at some other time, etc. Okay, so to finish, let's look at uh, the types of these objects. So let's look at type of problem. And you see that it's this um, it is an ODE problem, but it also has all of this other stuff which goes on and on and on and on and on and on uh, with a lot of nothings. And so what is going on there? So these are what are called type parameters. So this curly braces means that this is all actually part of the type of the object. And um, basically what's happening is, uh, okay, so let's look at the type parameters for this particular object. We can do that like this. 
uh, the type has this it is a Julia object and it has inside it a field called parameters and now I'm just putting it into, into making it into an array so that we can actually see it more nicely inside Pluto. Here we go. So these are the type parameters. Uh, so again, uh, you can see that, okay, for example, this tuple float 64, float 64, that's actually the type of the T span, the time span that we passed in. So you can see that, oh, some information about the type of the objects that are stored in inside the whole object, some information about that is actually being added into the type itself of the object ODE problem. And so why? What, what is going on here? And so basically the answer is that in Julia, in order to get efficiency or speed or performance, everything needs to be of a known type. Once you know the type of something, you can actually, Julia can generate efficient code for it, efficient machine code. If it doesn't know the type when it generates the code, then the code that it generates will be much less efficient. And so in order to make it so that you can use this ODE problem on many different you know, input types. For example, we had an input that was a scalar or an input that was a vector. Those need to actually be different ODE problem types. And the way to do that is by using these parameterized types. So let's look at it again at a simple example of how we could do that ourselves. So if we want this simple Euler output as, as, a, as a correspondence to the ODE solution, you know, if we put in, as I was just saying, a scalar, we want scalar values out if we, at, at each time. If we put in a vector initial condition, we want vectors out at each time. And so how could we represent that in inside my struct? So before, I, when I defined the previous version of the struct, oh, sorry, I'm not gonna go back, but um, when I defined the previous version of the struct, I had labeled, I had annotated that, oh, I know that the times are gonna be a, ve a vector of flow 64s. That's still gonna be the case, but now the values might be a vector of flow 64s if I have a flow 64 scalar value at each time, but they might be a vector of vector of flow 64 if I have a vector at each time. So a vector of vectors, we saw that a um, couple of uh, times ago. So, you know, I would want to have that type annotation or that type annotation and which one it, I will need to store depends on, you know, some, some, some information that I'm passing into my function. So the solution to that is actually, I only want to write this code once, right? Of course I could write two different, two different structs with different names like simple Euler output two underscore float 64 and simple Euler output to underscore vector vector float 64 or whatever. I could do that, but of course I don't want to do that. I want to just write the code once, but have these two different options of param of types being generated. And so the way to do that is like this, this with this syntax, with these curly braces again. So curly braces are always used for type parameters. So here you can think of T and U as kind of, they kind of act like variables but they're variables that can only represent types approximately. And so we've seen these before, right? Um, if you do M equals rand of two, two, it tells you that this is a matrix of float 64. So this curly braces means this is a matrix with float 64 inside. That is a type parameter of matrix. And if I do type of M, it actually tells me that matrix curly float 64 is an alias for array curly float 64 comma two. These are type, again, type parameters. So I have, a, I have an a sort of array type, but I have to specify for, for performance purposes, what are the objects that live inside and what is the dimension of the array? So I'm, that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm just saying that my ODE problem is gonna be a struct. It's gonna have these fields, T0, T final and U0, but I'm gonna have these types which can change in different versions of objects called my ODE problem or of type my ODE problem. So I'm gonna have my initial time and my final time. Instead of writing that as a tuple, let's just write it as in different um, fields, but they both are gonna to have to be of the same type T. So here I'm saying these are both of type T and because the T is the same, that means they have to have the same type. And then U0 is gonna be of a different type U. And I'm saying those are type parameters of my object. So now what's happening uh, of my new type, my OD problem? What is happening? What happens when I try and create an object of this type? So let's try and create my ODE problem. And I'm gonna pass in three and four as the initial and final times, which are integers. And I'm gonna pass in the float 100.0 as the initial value, 
Well, it creates, because successfully creates an object of type my ODE problem. It successfully puts T0 is three, T final is four, and U0 is 100.0. But you can see that it also did something else, which is that it sort of did pattern matching, if you like, on these types. And it said, oh, look, this fits the correct pattern. The pattern was that T0 and T final have to be of the same type. Uh, oh yeah, they are of the same type. And so I know, oh yes, then T, capital T, must be in 64, the type of this three and this four, the same type. And then the other type is float 64, that also matches the pattern. And so now it has constructed an object of type, my ODE problem, if you like, underscore in 64, underscore float 64. This is a sort of specialized version of this type. Whereas, and you can extract the data. Whereas if I pass in floats everywhere, it constructs a different type, actually. This is now a different type. It has the same structure, but now the, the types that are inside are now parameterized by this float64 and float64. So this is really a different type. But of course, it so, sort of looks the same. And if I use two different types as the arguments, a float and an int, it actually doesn't even let me construct that because those t's don't actually match. So I could then go and make a version of the constructor, a new constructor for my ODE problem that allowed me to do that and converted them automatically to the same type. It's actually pretty easy to do. I, I can, can do it, uh, except we're running out of time. So just, just to finish, we can also use vectors as the initial condition. So here's a vector initial condition. And you can see that now, oh, it recognized that that's a vector and the type parameter became vector. And so that is how these very complicated types are built up. So of course, you know, you were looking at those packages and the types that come out, they look very scary. But basically what happened was over time during the development of these packages, you know, initially they just started off with some simple types looking like this with just the basic information. And as they added more and more features, they realized, oh, we actually need to add more information into the type and more information and more information. And it just sort of ballooned out of control and you get these gigantic types. And so often what happens with those types is that it's actually may be quite slow to create new objects of that type because it's basically creating, it's basically generating new code every time you have a new combination of types. So that can be actually a bit slow. But then once you've done that initial compilation, running the code is very fast because it was able to generate a very efficient specialized version of the code for those types. So just to finish, let me do that uh, constructor. So I want to pass in a T0, a T final, and a U0 of any types. And then I want to, uh, so I'm making a new constructor for this problem, for this object. And I want to pass in, um, we're gonna actually promote these two things to the same type. So I do that like this, promote T0 and T final. That will give me a tuple, which I need to unpack using or splat using this splat operator and then u0. And now uh, I have to put that definition inside the defin inside the same, uh, that constructor inside the same cell. And when I do that, it should actually work. And uh, it did, didn't, something went wrong. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So let's say that that is of type. T and that is of type S where T and S. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is that going to work? Okay. Well, that's not going to work. Let's, let's, let's leave it then. Um, um, it, it is definitely possible to, to do this. Okay. So basically just to summarize, so we looked at this OD, this differential equations.jl package, which has these nice types that enable us to solve ODEs very easily as a user. But then once you sort of start digging down into the details of what's going on inside the package, you see that it's, 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 it's has a very clear, clear structure and it, it just looks a bit complicated, but actually um, it's just, you know, a very elaborated development on this, this theme of uh, parameterized types. Okay, thanks everybody. See you on Wednesday.